Welcome to Oaken Bros. This is Eric. I'm Michael. And if you want to learn about the secrets of the universe, the law of attraction, mysticism, brohood, gambling, movies, dragons, pop culture, archangels, magic, good food, business, health, family, and mediumship, smash that subscribe button, hit the thumbs up, press the noti icon, and spread this video around like cream cheese on a New York City bagel. We love it. So today we have on Mark Lanehart, award-winning and tested psychic medium. You can visit uh, marklanehart.com for more information and readings. Thank you for coming on, Mark. Hello, guys. Thanks for having me on. How are you guys doing? We're great. Ooh, well, man, I would just like to first say that I had a reading with Mark, and it was eye-opening, mind-blowing, uh, expanding conscious awareness, amazing. Uh, loved having the reading and really appreciate you coming on Open Bros. Really, really. You know. Well, again, thank you for the invite. And I, I actually was talking to, so I have a spiritual development group that we meet uh, on Wednesday nights and I've got students from across the nation, Canada and over in England. And I was actually sharing your story, story Michael, not personally, but I was sharing with them the perspective of how when you become aware and you look at things differently, the things, you know, we talked about uh, cash, for example, and how that message came through, you know, from the, the artist format of Johnny Cash, the singer. And then all of a sudden for you, it had a lot of relevance. And so it's always about perspective too, right? The art of spiritualism is the ability to shift your perspective because those that reside on the other side of death, uh, which is not the end, it's actually just like getting out of one car and getting into another. Right. Um, or as Chief Seattle, who I'm here in Seattle, Washington, as Chief Seattle once said, uh, there is no death. It's just a shifting of worlds. And wow. when you realize that they're around us, they find different ways to connect with us because they lose their voice. They lose the vibration off the vocal cord. And so therefore they come out with different ways, nature, music, books, lookalikes, people that look like you. People find things all the time. I, I have a stack of dimes on my desk for my brothers to let me know that they're always around me. So I, I just shared your story last night with my Thank group. Thank you. We love that. Yeah, the symbols I, are unbelievable. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah. Ask, ask away. Yeah, I want what I wanted to jump in with was you said spiritual prospector. Now yeah. that is so intriguing to me. What is that, and and what does that mean? Yeah. So over a decade ago, when I had started to go into spiritualism, because I come from a um, a very logical, analytical background, so. When I started out, I was in the U.S. Coast Guard for eight years. And so I was in the business of saving lives and law enforcement and protecting the coasts of the United States. And then when I got out of the Coast Guard, I shifted and became a professional firefighter EMT. So I was still working in the life-saving modalities, very logical, very critical thinking type of work. And then when I lost my brothers, uh, one to murder and one to brain cancer, mm -hmm. that trauma and tragedy, what I call the TNT that blew my life up, um, really sh started to get me thinking about death and dying. And I had no, trust me, I had no wants or plans of want, becoming a psychic or a medium or a spiritualist. And it was actually um, the term, the intuitive prospector came through when I was uh, taking my graduate studies here in Seattle, Washington at the University of Washington. And I thought I was going to shift from firefighting and EMT because I was injured. I had to retire due to injury back. I broke my back. And so I was going to be working on the sidelines of professional sports. So sports medicine, human performance, taping up the ankles and the joints, you know, whether collegiate or the professional, that's where the direction I was going. And it was during this uh, course of visualization, manifestation and for, the, for, for the professional athlete that I started to think about spiritualism. And I started to think about, okay, what can be kind of a man type of energy, like very masculine type of energy? Because in this field, I'm usually outnumbered. I'm usually the token male at a lot of the workshops and yeah. you know, a lot yeah. of women um, just be trying to get in touch with my intuitive side. And I was watching a show on Discovery Channel and it was prospecting. And I thought, ah, mm -hmm. oh, you know what? That's that's kind of a cool name because when you prospect in, you know, if you're digging in the dirt to find gold and diamonds and crystals, it's hard work, right? You're dirty, you're sweaty, you got mud all over you. And I realized that that is life. Life throws a lot of mud on us. And what we are doing is we are searching for that diamond within. So we would know from the laws of physics that diamonds are created under extreme pressures. And if there's no pressure, it just remains a piece of coal, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, the intuitive prospector was about discovering and exploring through body, mind, and spirit to discover the diamond in and take the pressures and the traumas and the tragedies and everything that I had gone through, including my own near-death experience, and bring that together into a concept called the intuitive prospector, where I work with people and do consultations and readings and events 
and really help people to prospect knowing that you know you're going to get out what you put in it just doesn't come delivered like amazon in today's modern age you don't just get on the computer and order and it you know two days later it's at your doorstep mm -hmm. there's a lot of work to have this awakening to have awareness to trust your intuition which is the language of your soul so the intuitive prospector and when i first came when the when the name came to me we were in a meditation believe it or not and i thought man that's just a stupid name <laughs> like you know the whole concept of even what i was doing was like this is really just crazy am i losing my mind i'm hearing voices i'm seeing things that i don't understand so there was about two years of self-analyzation and self-sabotage and you know critique of myself because i'd come from from the fire service and now all of a sudden there's this big shift of no you're not going to do sports medicine you're actually going to be a spiritualist doing radio and writing articles for magazine and doing shows like your show you know and doing readings with people all around the world jump to today decade later now my brothers have been in the spirit world for over 20 years but you know if you've ever had a loss you realize that time kind of stands still right it's been 20 years but it to me it feels just like a few years ago right and you jump to today i love what i do I, I think the secret of life is getting paid to do what you love and i love working with people and helping people i don't heal people i'm not a healer per se but i can lead people to doorways and modalities to find the healing that comes from within just like the reading you read did with michael and, and some of the healing that he experienced um you know based on me just being the voice of that person coming through that's really all i am is the person uh that has the voice the physical voice to give that information how did you deal with the grief of of losing two brothers i mean that is i mean i it's i couldn't even imagine um did you channel that grief into just finding answers or was there something that one of your brothers did where you're like wait he's still here i feel him i i hear him you know like what happened how did you deal with that yeah i think it was kind of both eric in the fact that i channeled but i kept it in right so i was in the coast guard at the time i was 27 so still pretty young uh, still pretty arrogant and cocky and doing what I do and I didn't need help. I didn't need to honor my grief. And I, that's a mistake. So anybody watching the show or listening to the show, always honor your grief because there's a difference between grieving the loss of somebody and mourning the loss of somebody. And what I mean by that is I held my grief internally and it caused me a lot of emotional pain, physical pain, mm -hmm. uh, relationship pain. And when I realized that I started to need to mourn my brothers because my brother, um, Michael, his name was Michael, my little brother. We didn't have any answers for almost four months after he was murdered. We didn't have people, we didn't have any suspects. We went through eventually five murder trials where five people were convicted. Uh, and then at that time, my brother was also, you know, passing from his brain cancer and he was leaving four children behind. So I kind of had to manage all that. So it was kind of like more damage control and survival mode at the time. Mm -hmm. And then people will realize after the death and dying, that's where that sets in. That's where you need to start honoring your grief. So going back to grief is an internal process process that's different for everybody. How you mourn that person is your expression to heal and to accept that death is guaranteed for all of us, just like they say death and taxes. But I always remind people to honor your grief through the power of mourning, whether it's singing, writing going out and, and screaming at the moon or what i did is i screamed at god i was pretty upset with you know what my version of what i thought god was felt very alone so it, there's power in honoring your grief through the power of mourning and don't hold it in so i started to search out well i was actually was forced upon me i started with biofeedback i'm like i don't need help you don't need to go to your happy place but after eight sessions of biofeedback i started to see the power in the mind and what the mind is capable of doing lowering my heart rate lowering my breath rate uh, raising my temperature up and went oh, okay this is interesting and that doorway then started to lead me to explore the psychic what is the intuition what is mediumship and i was having connections with my brother who was now on the other side and i didn't know what to make of that and i started searching out for you know answers and help and that led me to a couple different places from here in the united states at the berkeley psychic institute in california to the Omega Institute in upstate New York, uh, Rhinebeck, New York. And then that eventually led me the last decade to be studying over at a college in England called the Arthur Finley College. Mm -hmm. So those little things kind of just brought me to today. And, um, you know, I just say honor your grief through the power of mourning, because if you hold it in, there's a lot more negative things that happen to you from the mind, the body and the spirit. And uh, that's what I teach on now is helping people through the grieving process. Mark, do you, I've read this before. My mom, our mom is a huge believer in this and she's a medium as well. 
do you feel that like there was a life contract with you and your brothers that you guys came back to this earth and they chose this way out? Because I've I've read that before that it nothing happens by accident in right. this on this side of things. And I'm I'm curious to know what your beliefs are on that. Do you feel that you know we choose the way we're gonna go out, or do you feel that everything is random? There's no coincidence, you know, there are coincidences. What are your thoughts on that about losing two brothers? Do you feel that this was um a story that you, that you were left here to tell. Our, our grandfather was in the Holocaust. He lost his entire family, both of his sisters, both of his parents. He was the one survivor out of the entire family. And that's why Eric and I are here today because wow. our grandfather survived the Holocaust. So, you know, do you feel that there's like this, it's a script that we're living out? Or do, do you feel that there's a contract that we have before we get here? Because clearly we're all souls in meat suits, right? Like yeah. this is this is not... This is not birth to death. There's something right. bigger here. Yeah. You know, I've, and I've had long conversations with uh, colleagues and my mentors about this exact thing. And I always come back to the greatest power we have while we're here is free will and choice. And when we come here, I always, you know, remind people that life is an acronym. Learn it from experience. And experience doesn't have a definition of good, bad, or ugly. It, it's all combined into life. That's what life is. And I do, in a sense, feel that we have experiences that shape us and mold us because i guarantee you i wouldn't be talking to you gentlemen today if my brothers wouldn't have passed the way they did at the same time exactly. it wouldn't have changed me i would still probably be doing something more in the the line of fire service or uh, healthcare. um and i i do believe that we have certain pathways that we choose before because we're, we're energy and spirit before we come into this physical flesh suit that you talked about and we're here to learn and it, you know it's through learning and growth and again growing pains are not always you know they call them growing pains for a reason but it makes me feel like it it's preparing us this is kind of like earth school right this is like we're here through and if you think about just hierarchy what you've done your entire life from school from kindergarten to junior high to high school some go on to vocation some go on to um college and then you have life after that and it's like i i feel like we are here to learn and to grow and i do feel in a sense it is a free will and choice of that that sole contract um, that we can decide to you know experience um, because a lot of my work that I do today is really like you know they talk about planting a garden it's something that you plant but you don't necessarily get to enjoy it's like it's leaving my story behind so others can you know learn from that and hear the pain and, and suffering and tragedies that I went through but knowing that death is not the end death is just the beginning of the next adventure. Um, and it's not to be anything feared of, uh, you know, you think about it on a daily average, you take the pandemic outside what we're, go what we're going through currently, there's about 50,000 people that, that leave the planet every single day around the world. You know, I've done podcasts on this and shows on this where, you know, we've done studies that, you know, there's 50,000 people leaving in the, in one day and there's a hundred thousand people coming in. So it's like, okay, that's a lot of people, you know, based on right. just you know, accidents or sickness or just natural causes. And that's always just kind of stuck with me. And some would call it the matrix, you know, are we plugged into the matrix? And uh, right. some scientists have even said that, you know, multidimensional, we could get into string theory. And, you know, are, is there a version of you living back in, you know, the 1400s, Michael, why this current Michael is living this, right. and, you know, like a, we always talk about it, you know, for your listeners, um, like a coat rack, like you have a coat rack and you hang your coat or your hat on all these different pegs, but that peg is reflective of something in the past, something today, something that you're doing in the future. Um, you know, because people always come to me and ask me, I want to know my future. And I always remind them that the best part about the future is it comes one day at a time. Right. You know, you can't go out and, and, you know, grab your future just like you can't go grab your past, even though we like to suffer our past. It's really about the magic in the moment that Eckhart Tolle teaches on, right. uh, that some of my mentors teach on. And that's where the magic is, is in the now and planting seeds today for what you hope you envision your future to be tomorrow. So, yeah, it's maybe very reminded us of that so it's, you know i've learned this recently and you know having this having this show has taught me so much spiritually and it's given me so much confidence in in spirituality um we interviewed eben alexander dr eben alexander and he said um you know your brain does not store your thoughts or your memories yes. and that was True. that was like that was life before knowing that and then life after that realizing that that yeah when we connect with our father he knows us 
he he remembers things from his past and he's Eric, watching things Eric, go on now. I got on with Mark and he's like, your dad's here. Like right. it was, there was no like. That's my that's my point. That that I, very I, I, obviously, like we're our brains are antennas, and we're we're connect. Some, everybody is connected to their soul on the other side, and I would not be shocked to know that if we be everything is living together all at once. Well, there's no past, present, and future when this is gone. When this. Our dad right. came through one reading, the first reading, 30 days after he passed, and he said, nothing has changed. He said, the only thing has changed is my form. Yeah. He said, nothing has changed. So that's, that's you said you had an NDE? You had a near-death experience? I've had a, both an NDE and an OBE, which is an out-of-body experience. Explain. Well. Explain. We'll, I love this shit. Explain and then, it. And then, and then <laughs> after that, have you ever done like DMT or ayahuasca or anything like that? I have not. It's on my list to um, let me go back to Eric's question first and then I'll sure. Sure. Yeah, no, I, we have a million questions. If this goes past whatever the time frame, just go okay. for it. I want to hear this <laughs> just because I'm so fascinated with the metaphysical approach, you know, because I learned a lot. You know, unfortunately, like I said, I lost my older brother, Todd, to brain cancer. But before he passed, he was brain mapped twice here in Seattle, Washington. He was one of the first um, patients to actually have computers put into his head. It was kind of weird. It, he looked like something from Star Trek, the Borg, if you watch Star Trek and the Borg. Uh, he had all these wires come out of his head, but what they learned from that was how the brain can rewire neuroplasticity, which we were taught early on that you got to a certain age and your brain stopped rewiring itself. And now science teaches us differently that it's not. And you talked about Eric, your memories uh, being stored in here when we're realizing that it's not. So think of every memory you've had in your entire life and it not being stored necessarily in the brain. And we think of technology with cloud computing and going to the cloud. And I've always said, you know, what if consciousness is eternal, but all of our memories fade with the, the dissolution of the brain? What if we live infinite lifetimes, but we're always destined to recall nothing of them once they are over? So I've always thought about that, that terminology, because when I learned about my brother's cancer, he had it here on his left temporal. And um, it was called glioblastiotomy, and it spread. So that's why he passed, because he couldn't get it all. But what the surgeon told me, she, she uh, was a surgeon from Duke University that flew in to do the surgery. She said, everything on the left temporal is literally your memory and your speech. And she could literally take a ballpoint pen while Todd was awake during the surgery. He was awake and they'd show him flashcards. She could take this ballpoint pen and press down on a part of this brain and he wouldn't be able to speak and he wouldn't be able to identify what his, his vision was telling him with the cue cards. So if you think about just how amazing the brain is metaphysically and how we can rewire our brains, which we start getting into mediumship, we start getting into intuition, awareness, uh, psychic energy, which means of the soul. It's always been very fascinating to me. The supercomputer, which lives between two temples, the temporal bone, we call this temple. So this is obviously a temple to something, the crown chakra, the pineal gland, which is very interesting. We could spend hours talking about that stuff. But Michael's right. There is no time. We're the only species that measures our life by this little clock, this, you know, 12 hour window of, you know, what we're supposed to do in the day. But no other species on the planet does that except for humans. So that's always been time construct has always been interesting to me as well. Right. We make right. it complicated for no reason. What's, yeah. wh what happened in the NDE? How, how did it happen? What did you see? What did you experience? Yeah. So the NDE. So I had so first I had my NDE, which was when I was five years old, I being a boy climbing up in trees, um, was riding a, like a tree branch, like a horse. That's the last thing I remember. Well, the tree branch broke and I fell about 20 feet on my head and I was in a coma for about three days. Um, and during that time, um, I had some instances where they weren't sure if I was going to make it. Now, I don't remember that part of it, but what I do remember is walking what I what I call the shadow people. They were very tall people. They weren't male. They weren't female. And they just held my hand and they were showing me around. And they didn't talk to me like I'm talking to you. They talked to me telepathically. Like they, I, could, knew, I knew their thoughts and I knew, and I felt very warm and I felt very comfortable, nothing to be afraid of. And they just showed me around and they walked me by the hand. And then um, after I came out of my coma, um, I didn't recognize anybody. Everybody was standing at the foot of my bed and I was upset because everybody was staring at me, I guess. And uh, finally I got a little sick and my memory started to come back and um, spent a few more days in the hospital after that. 
And so for me, I never really thought about because I was five years old when it happened. I, and I really never recalled back to that. What recalled me back to that first experience was when I was 27 at the height of my losing my brothers, I was in a river accident. I got trapped here in the Yakima River here in Washington State, just not paying attention. We were partying, had two rafts, and we came around the bend. The river was moving pretty quick and realized there was a log jam, very dangerous situation. So uh, three of us, my wife included, pushed the one raft so it would clear the log jam. We thought, oh, we'll just get on top of the log jam and go over it. Well, that didn't happen. The raft hit the log jam, sucked under. My friend Yancey went over it. I pushed my wife Jenny to the side to clear her, and guess who went right into the middle of it? Yours truly. So I'm stuck in this log jam under about four feet of water with the river running against me, and I thought, okay, here we go. This is it. This is how I'm going. I'm going to drown, and I love water. My nickname growing up was fish. So I just kind of surrendered to it and just kind of accepted it, and all of a sudden, I started to feel the presence of my soul and my body start to move up. Now, we think heaven is up and hell is down, but we live on a round planet. So metaphysically, you can't go up or down. There is no up or down. But that sensation of leaving the body, and it was very peaceful, Michael. It, I didn't have any fear. I felt very, again, that same feeling and emotion that I had when I was five years old. And I started to look back down at my body and see myself pinned underwater. And as I left out of my body, all of a sudden, I shot right back down into my body and I popped up. I, I don't know how to this day, why or what happened. You know, the analytical mind will jump in and try to debunk it. Oh, I just must have slid down the log or the right. spiritual mind will say, oh, well, you had more work to do. Um, but when I popped up, you know, uh, a minute later, uh, people were screaming. They thought I had drowned. And it right. was just a very interesting experience. And I, would, I wouldn't say that was my NDE. I would say that was an OBE because I started to have that out-of-body experience. Did you see your body, Mark? Did yeah, you I looked back down at myself. I actually – You saw yourself? Were you – would, would you be freaking out? I mean, I think I would be like, I'm dead, right? Like, were you freaking out? Yeah, I, well, I, I fought, I fought, I fought, I fought until finally I couldn't fight anymore. And I just no, 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 no. When, when I'm saying- How like, long when, were you on, how long were you under out of curiosity? Uh, probably about maybe two minutes. Maybe. I'm saying, I'm saying freaking out from your spiritual side, looking down at your body going, oh, no, 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 really? No at all it was such a piece michael that i towed the line i didn't want to actually come back when i actually shot back into my body That's i was here i came back yeah. and they've done studies with people even in ors you know i still work in healthcare i have a day job still and i work federally in, in healthcare right. and they've done studies where they've put stuff on top of rafters you know 20 feet up and writ, writ wrote uh, little comments on the on the beams above and when people have passed over from you know a near-death experience when they come back one of the first questions they ask is like why did you write, you know, the, the elephant in the pink tutu dancing on a tightrope? Oh, my God. No shit. And they would be like, how would you know that? There's no way you could get up there to see it because they were ascending up, looking back at their bodies, and then all of a sudden they see this writing on one of the um, the support Really? And That's so incredible. They so, so, like, yeah. how could never heard somebody, that. How could somebody debunk that? What what could they pass somebody who says you know it's 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 birth, it's to, birth death, to death? It's a it's a hallucinogenic you know, then, experience. Yeah, it's it's lights out. You know, you're in the dirt, and, and your and brain plays tricks on you during an NDE. It, you're yeah. how could how could anybody explain? Well, in, this, in this world, somebody's always going to try to debunk it. Let's just be clear about that. There's always going to be somebody that is a skeptic or a critic or a pundit. You know, I always tell people people come to me. Some call me crazy, and others seek out seek me out for advice. But as far as to try to debunk that from a clinical standpoint, when they're actually flatlined, and you can show that they're flatlined, that there is no heart activity but the brain still continues on and you show that you've died and you're reading this message. And then two minutes or five minutes or 10 minutes later, they bring you back and you're saying, why is that? That's really hard scientifically to debunk. And trust right. me, I have a scientific mind. Right. Uh, you know, I really try to debunk stuff all the time, but at some point you just become a believer and just kind of accept that it is bigger than ourselves. We're just very, we're touching just a glimpse of what is still out there. I, I love the posters in the background. That was one of the first things I said to you, Star Wars and the lightsabers. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this out there. Star Wars is a documentary. Like the Matrix is a – I think Star Wars was real. It, in my George mind, Lucas. George Lucas. He knows something. He knows something. He knows something. This wasn't just some fantasy bullshit. He knew the – Star Wars reveals to everyone the secrets of the universe, that you can move shit with your mind, that you have yeah. higher guides. I'm getting the chills thinking about this. What do you what what is your love 
spiritually for Star Wars. Uh, Star Wars is great in general, but is, there's a message there. Well, what? let's let's start with movies just in general. Movies is such an escape from life. And when I was, you know, this is 1977, so I'm what five five years old. And again, just had my near death experience with the walking with the shadow people. And then Star Wars comes out on May 25th, right? I know the date. I'm a pretty Star Wars nerd. But I went to the movie 23 times. I saw this movie wow. 23 times in yep. the movie theater. I had no idea what the why I resonated with it, but there was something. And it resonates with people even 45 yeah. years later. It's making billions of dollars. It still resonates with people. And George Lucas took a concept that was very ancient yes. and you know took samurais and put them into, you know, lightsabers and took the thought of, of mindfulness and you know he always said that your focus determines your reality very spiritual concepts and packaged them up into the star wars brand that we all know and love today and i've always just believed in the force because again if we go back to science the hef which is the human energy field or your some call it the auric field your energy you know just like a car gives off exhaust we as humans give off our own energy our own exhaust if you will right. And I've always believed ever since those days of a force that that combines us, that uh, brings us together, even if we're very different in you know what we believe and how we look. Uh, but that force is what we return back to. Even just go back to nature. You know, we're we're sixty five percent water. We need water, right? We can only go a couple of days without water. Right. But we know that water has a capability to shift from ice to rain to steam to snow. Holy and we breathe liquid for nine months, right? We breathe, we're in the womb, breathe <laughs> liquid. So who's to say that that force, we return back to source from the laws of physics, if you apply the laws of physics, you have to return back to source. Energy just doesn't hang out. And I think that's why some religions got away from purgatory, because you're either here or you're there. So when people come to me and say, I've got a ghost, I'm like, well, did the ghost say anything to you? And they're like, well, no, I just catch them. And I say, that's residual energy. You're just catching right. loops of their energy. Now, if the ghost turns to you and says, hi, Mark, how are you? That's an intelligent communication, and then we start we start talking more about mediumship. Right. Not what you see in Hollywood movies. I don't see dead people in their their you know how they went out. They never usually present that way to me. It's th that's um, theater. That's theater. Can, Mark. Can we, hold on one yeah. second. Yeah. Can Can you back up a few? And yeah. and and th that whole water thing. I, I re, I'm, I'm you just in, I saw my brother's it. mind just explode right I'm, now. I'm, I'm I'm into it. I'm into yeah. it. Uh, yeah, just just like say it slower or if you have anything more on it, like expand on it a little bit. Yeah. So when I try to talk about transformations, you know, if you think about the ocean, the ocean heats up and that water evaporates up into the clouds. The clouds grab that moisture. And when the clouds hit a higher range of mountains, per se, it'll start to rain or it'll start to snow. And then it'll sit there for a little bit and then it gets warmer and that snow melts to water. We know that the water returns to the rivers and we know at one point that water returns to source. It returns, it flows, always flows downhill and it always returns to the ocean. So it's like this big cycle of different ways of being and kind of going back to what Michael was saying about different ways of being here with our soul contract. Sometimes I think we're, you know, maybe I'm in the water stage. Maybe when I die, I'm into the uh, steam phase. When I get past that journey, I go into the snow phase. But it's all about just transformations in different ways of being. Um, and I would even go even a step further because I know a lot about the, the the human body, right, with my background in emergency medicine. And I'm a certified healthcare provider. And I know everything about the heart. And I've worked on people, you know, had heart attacks, flatlined. But the one thing we don't know, and it's always stuck in my mind, is the energy in the center of the heart. Some call it the divine spark. Some call it the God within that energy has to come from somewhere because without it, your heart doesn't beat. If your heart doesn't beat, you don't breathe. There's no you. So that energy, when you, when you do transition or you pass over, that energy has to go somewhere. The question is, where does it go? Does it return to source? Some people want to say it goes up to a cloud and you play a harp for the rest of your, your life. I think that sounds pretty boring to be honest with you. hundred percent. Right. We asked our dad through several mediums and, and he came through and he said, there's no, he goes, you know, Michael and Eric, there's no dude in the sky pointing that you're going to hell. You're yeah, going here. He's you're busy. Going here. He's he's working. He's busy. You know, right? And and I and and like my father-in-law who also passed away, you know, a year or so ago. Um, he's he's a, he's being a guidance counselor there. He yeah. he's he's doing what he loves to do. And our father is there, and he's he's with um with higher beings. And and we've heard this numerous times from numerous different mediums, and they're saying all the exact same things. And they don't know us from a hole in the wall. Right. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's 
it's it's definitely not um you're not sitting on a cloud with with angel wings i love the movie what dreams may come with robin williams oh my god i gotta god. watch i gotta watch that again yeah. yeah that and cloud atlas are two of the movies again you can throw the matrix in there you can throw the star wars movie in there because those are but cloud atlas which is based on reincarnation over yes. a 500 year period with tom hanks and Halle berry and hugh grant really great movie based on the book mm -hmm. didn't do well at the movie um uh didn't resonate it, it didn't resonate because people didn't understand it correct but if you watch it a few times you're like oh i get it you know um and then with um what dreams may come i thought that was a great visual representation of what we choose heaven to be the many mansions or you know the darkness if that's what you choose it to be uh, but you know people flying around with big you know the akashic records and still learning um every person i've connected with says that the hierarchy is real and that the learning continues the learning never stops so um, it, I, you know i i i'm on the precipice of something big with my you know film career you even called it you were you were so spot on with what was happening and the idea that like like i write i was writing a movie called heavenwood and it was about this guy who dies young actor dies and he goes to heaven and he's got to rewrite his next life he, mm -hmm. and, and and all of heaven is like hollywood reinvented there's the the angels or the writers and they're writing everyone's life and you you know there is an element of free will in this whole nine yards and god's the the production the head of production and G, you know jesus buddha all the, the, the vps of you know production everything and i pitch it to a studio and they said movies about the afterlife don't do well they said the people people it's, the, 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 the it's best too one, conflicting yeah, the best one that i've seen in my opinion is defending your life <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it's a classic. It's yeah. that's it's an amazing movie. Um, but, I didn't really have it. There wasn't really a question there, but like it was kind of like a statement that afterlife movies are so interpretive. The Matrix is a documentary. I will I will die by those words. Star I Wars. Started, I had to go back and rewatch it because I didn't 100%. understand. Avatar. Avatar is a yeah. documentary not the last airbender james cameron's avatar they said that is as close to death as you can imagine that you your physical body dies and you become this other thing that you, yeah. a, another consciousness i've read that in many spiritual you know blogs magazines and everything that avatar is a documentary there's something about movies this medium that that is so reflective on life mm -hmm. um what are your top five favorite spiritual movies not movies but spiritual movies I don't uh, mean to put you on the spot like that. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I don't think I've ever been asked that question. Well, and I go back to, you know, you said movies don't do well in the afterlife, but Star Wars covers, you know, Force <laughs> Ghost. Uh, right. Avatar is one of the most uh, successful movies of all time, right? right? As far as money, if you want to say money. Right. Um, I would have to say... Uh, spiritual, spiritual movies are different from the actual movies filmed about the afterlife. But that's uh, what that's what this producer told me. He's yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if I have an actual favorite um because again some of the some of the best stuff has been you know made into a movie from books like you know cloud atlas which is a right. very mm -hmm. interesting spiritual book right. um made into a movie that didn't do well right because again right. the concept it, it's hard to transfer that over Correct. um yeah i don't i don't know if i actually have an actual i do a lot of reading so i you know with me being a radio i get books every week and so i, I do uh, readings, um, read a book about, about a book a week is or try to, really? um, but you know, I go back to more just books. Like, you know, um, I go back to the four agreements. I just had the honor of yeah, interviewing Don Miguel Ruiz on my show. And I started off oh with God, the four agreements great. over a decade ago. Um, I, love I love, um, Paul Selig who does a lot of uh, book of truth, Eckhart Tolle. Um, these have you, met, of, have you met Eckhart Tolle? I have not. No. Okay. But so, you never know. So I, I yeah. before, beat on Miguel. So before yeah. we wrap it up, um, you know, you mentioned that you read, and and that always goes in line with just more law of the attraction, law of attraction type stuff. Uh, what are your thoughts on it? Because I know, um, like a lot of NDEers, um, they they're like they just want to be one with the light, and they know once they're one with the light, then they they have everything that they need, and they'll get everything that they want. Are you more of a um, uh, like a secret type of person, more spiritual, or you know, what are your thoughts on on law of attraction? Well, you know, if you you, you get into scripture about what you put out, you get back what you uh, sow, right. you reap. I mean, there's 
there's the uh, the law, the universal laws of you know what you put in, you get out. I, so I do believe that you know people say, well, that's karma. Or, you know, you're going to put bad out, so you're going to get bad back. I think karma for me is a series of teachable moments, and you again, free will and choice, how you want to navigate that, because again, your focus does determine your reality. Um, but as far as like attracts like, or the secret, or that energy. I do believe that you know what you put out does come back. It's like throwing a, a pebble in a pond and knowing that that ripple goes out, right. and eventually it does come back by the laws of physics. We may not wait around for it to come back, but eventually that energy returns. And you know, just trying to—I I always just try to be the better version of what I was yesterday for today in that moment. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, having an awakening, having a spiritual awakening, this isn't always cupcakes and unicorns and rainbows. And I teach on that. It can be some very dark nights of the soul, especially if you've lost your father or your father-in-law or, you know, for me, my brothers and, and my father and my father-in-law as well. But you can take all that and focus on the bad and the negative of it, or you can turn it. And again, kind of like what I say with what dreams may come, your focus, you can determine if you want to go in the dark or you can focus if you want to be on the light, knowing that if you right. stay in the light, you will be taken care of. They will meet your every need, but they're not going to do it all for you. You've got to meet them halfway because right. there's that balance. Two halves make a whole. And again, if you're going to put out negative, then your reality becomes negative. If you, if you put out light and want to be, you know, when I tell people I'm a psychic or a medium, it's not about doing readings and making money or being on shows. It's about right. being in service to help others. Yep. And I've always been in service, whether it was for my country, the local community, as in being the fire service, or now just being a spiritual prospector, helping others prospect for that diamond well, that's yeah. in all of us, that, that energy, that diamond that makes us go. So that's really what I'm all about in this day and age. That's, that's that's incredible. You know, there there always has to be an exchange. You know, that's that's the that's the laws of the universe. That's the laws of spirituality. That you know, if you're giving a service, you need to get something in return. And you know, sometimes it is a pat on the back, or sometimes it is you know someone saying thank you. But sometimes it is that you know a couple hundred dollars because right. it just is what it is. We're the only species that pays to live here, right? right. So we have this, this commodity. But I always remind people, your greatest rewards in life is not money. It's actually your health. Your health 100%. is your true health and your time. Your time is your greatest commodity. So people are only paying me for my time, not to give them a reading because it's my wow. time. To in. So that's where I come from. Because I had a really struggle, Eric, with charging to people like, you have a gift. You should just give it away. But if Our you mother – our mother did that. what you just said. Our mother's like, I can't charge for this. It's and then she went, to, she went to a medium and our father came through and was like, you better charge for this. This is your time that you're My mentor you helped me with that. My mentor helped me to understand to put a value to you and the value of the work you're doing because it's about your time. Mm -hmm. So, um, you Love know, it. I, that first so, from. Mark, where can people find you? What services do you actually provide for them? And uh, yeah, so plug away. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you again for allowing me to be on the show, uh, marklanehart.com, or you can internet search the Intuitive Prospector. I'm very easily found now. Sometimes I want to hide and not be found, uh, but you can find me through, um, I'm on a few professional directories where I've been vetted, background tested, uh, background checked, uh, Best American Psychics, Best Psychic Directory, uh, Aerial Spiritual Community. Those are the three that I'm associated with based on, and I always challenge people, if you're going to do this work, go get tested, just like a lawyer, just like a doctor, stand in front of a board, right. uh, go to a college, continue to grow with this. But marklanehart.com would be the best uh, one-stop shop for your all of your spiritual prospecting needs, I guess. So At, with readings, you know, every reading is different. It's like a box of chocolates. It could be mediumship, it could be psychic, it could be numerology, uh, it could be more inspirational. For Michael, it was all about mediumship. Dad popped in. I didn't get a chance to really get going, mm -hmm. and Dad was already in the room you know, uh, throwing cash. So, uh, <laughs> you know, so it really just depends. Um, but I really just, you know, my, my main focus is to help people, you know, with grieving and death and dying and right. inspirational. So that's actually what my Myers-Briggs profile is being an inspirer. As a testimonial, everyone listening to this, uh, everyone go get a reading with Mark. He was incredible, very grounded, very down to earth, very cool. And I mean, like, I, I'm so happy and grateful that you came onto our show um, you got, you got friends for life, you know, and anytime you need, uh, an outlet or something, Eric and I are here, you could always join Oak and bros and, you know, we're grateful that you came on really. And the reading was great. Well, thank you, Michael. And thank you, Eric, for your time. Again, your time is your greatest commodity. And, uh, let's have you guys, uh, jump over and be on inspired living radio and let's continue to love chat. to, we'd love to, absolutely. Oh, would love it. And Mark, I, I have the book 
Um, it's in my office. I haven't been to the office, but I am going to go back on Monday. I will be sending out Monsterland to you, signed and you know, to Mark. So right. Well, and then yeah, we can talk about that, and I can I can return the favor, and that like attracts like energy that we're talking about. Hundred percent. We love it. Everybody, please like, subscribe, and share this show. Visit marklanehart.com. We appreciate everybody tuning in, and uh, we'll catch you all next time. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys.